At around 9 p.m. on December the 17th of 2016, 25-year-old Monet Thomas was attacked by her neighbor in the communal hallway of a multi-unit dwelling in East Rutherford, New Jersey. Thomas had just returned from walking her dog when 24-year-old Francis Tatoli charged at her with a knife and then dragged her by the throat into his apartment. Surveillance footage revealed that she tried to fight off her attacker for six minutes. A few moments later, Tatoli emerged from his apartment covered in blood and drinking a beverage. The victim's boyfriend, Jonathan Ferreira, saw the dog outside the building located at 258 Summer Street and brought it inside. He then discovered Thomas, who was critically injured and unresponsive, inside the doorway of the suspect's first floor apartment. Tatoli fled the scene and Thomas was taken to Hackensack University Medical Center. As part of a joint investigation conducted by the Bergen County Sheriff's Department and Prosecutor's Office, Tatoli was arrested the following day. Concurrently, a bloody knife was recovered from the crime scene. Ten days later, on the morning of December the 28th, the victim succumbed to her injuries and was pronounced dead. The suspect, who'd initially been charged with attempted murder, was subsequently accused of murder, felony murder, and kidnapping. He was jailed at the Bergen County Jail on a $5 million bond. In court, the defense attempted to portray the cold-blooded murder as the result of Tatoli's years-long drug abuse, but he was ultimately convicted of all charges on November the 1st of 2022. The man had served a total of 2,314 days in custody before he was sentenced on April the 19th of 2023. According to the prosecutor's press release, he was given a 55-year prison term, which included time already served. He was reportedly subject to the No Early Release Act, meaning he'd need to serve at least 85% of his sentence before being eligible for parole. Number 29. Maurice E. Watkins and Pierre C. Williams In May of 2016, 33-year-old Maurice E. Watkins was facing an eviction filed in court by his landlord in Columbus, Ohio. The 50-year-old property owner, Joseph P. Remlinger, met with Watkins to allow him to settle a portion of his unpaid rent. The landlord drove to the Southside Rental Home, located on Grasmere Avenue, on the evening of June the 2nd of 2016. Instead of settling the debt, Watkins climbed into Remlinger's minivan and shot him three times. He then went inside the home and revealed what had just unfolded to 26-year-old Pierre C. Williams, who'd been staying over for the past few nights. The two men took the minivan to a vacant garage in the 700 block of Lily Avenue, where Williams set it ablaze with his landlord's body inside. Columbus firefighters discovered Remlinger's charred remains after extinguishing the fire. A few hours later, during an execution of a search warrant at the man's property, a detective observed Watkins driving by the scene. Patrol officers pulled him over and recovered a 45 caliber handgun that matched the bullets found in the victim's body. Law enforcement then arrested Watkins on a charge of murder. The other suspect was arrested after having burns treated at a local fire station. On July the 10th of 2017, Watkins pleaded guilty to aggravated arson, aggravated murder, and abuse of a corpse. He was sentenced to life in prison with no chance of parole for 30 years. Williams pleaded guilty to tampering with evidence, arson, and abuse of a corpse and was sentenced to six years behind bars during a separate hearing. Number 28. Charity Sophia Goodwin a crew working on a cell phone tower near the 3200 block of Falls Road in Hampstead, Maryland, discovered a dead body on the morning of June the 27th of 2014. The remains were located along the border of a wooded area next to a grain field. The next day, the office of the chief medical examiner in Baltimore determined that the victim, 50-year-old Prakash Rampat Singh, had died of a gunshot wound. The man's Dodge pickup truck was subsequently found abandoned in Prince George's County. Rampat Singh was a property manager in Baltimore who had often traveled to the area where his body was found. He owned at least three homes in the city according to state property records. Officials from the Carroll County State's Attorney's Office and Maryland State Police homicide detectives investigated the matter for multiple years before any meaningful developments came about. It wasn't until December of 2021, over seven years after Rampart Singh's murder, that an indictment was issued against Charity Sophia Goodwin. The 38-year-old was Rampart Singh's tenant at the time of the killing. Authorities believed that before the man's death, he'd gone to the property that Goodwin was renting. 
where a confrontation ensued between the two. Rampat Singh was allegedly kidnapped, driven away from the scene in his own vehicle, and later gunned down. Goodwin was held behind bars in Mecklenburg County, North Carolina, before being extradited back to Maryland. She was charged with murder in the first degree, kidnapping, armed robbery, and motor vehicle theft, among other offenses. Number 27. Ron Jermaine Bell. 75-year-old community activist Sadie Roberts Joseph from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, was last seen alive when she visited her sister at around 11 a.m. on July the 12th of 2019. An hour and a half later, an anonymous caller reported finding her lifeless body inside her car behind an abandoned house in the 2300 block of North 20th Street. Autopsy results indicated that her death was caused by traumatic asphyxia, including suffocation, and it was officially classified as a homicide. Investigators focused on the 90-minute period from when she was last seen alive to the time her body was discovered. Residents of the community provided several leads that helped authorities identify the suspect, 37-year-old Ron Jermaine Bell. The latter, who'd been living in one of the homes that the victim was renting out, was taken into custody on the afternoon of July the 16th, of 2019. At the time, he already had an outstanding warrant for unrelated charges. According to his arrest affidavit, Bell denied seeing Roberts Joseph, his landlady, on the day of the killing. However, surveillance footage revealed that he'd been in the area when Roberts Joseph's vehicle was abandoned. Additionally, a witness gave a description of the man who left the car and walked away, which matched Bell's profile. The suspect's DNA was also discovered on the victim's body. Authorities believed that Bell had several months of unpaid rent, estimated at around $1,200, which he sought to circumvent by eliminating his landlady. He faced a mandatory life sentence if found guilty of his first-degree murder charge. Number 26. James Cody and Desiree Rabb. At least 23 shell casings were found scattered around Hyde Park in St. Louis, Missouri, where a 72-year-old man was shot in the head on March the 8th of 2022. When authorities arrived at the scene, located in the 3900 block of North 25th Street, they found Michael Kelly of St. Anne in the driver's seat of his Chevrolet Silverado truck. Kelly, who owned several properties in the area, had suffered multiple gunshot wounds. He was pronounced dead at the scene. During the ensuing police investigation, it was determined through surveillance video that a man had fired several shots at Kelly's truck before fleeing in a gray Nissan sedan. Investigators found out that the vehicle had been rented by 27-year-old James Cody. A week after the shooting, Cody was arrested and accused of armed criminal action and first-degree murder. He admitted to the shooting and told officers the location of the murder weapon, as well as the clothes he'd worn on the day of the incident. In March of 2023, Cody's girlfriend Desiree Rabb was charged with first-degree murder and armed criminal action for her alleged role in Kelly's killing. The 27-year-old woman was arrested on April the 3rd of 2023 and was held without bond. She admitted to being the one behind the wheel of the Nissan while her boyfriend pulled the trigger. According to charging documents, the couple had rented a property from the victim. At the time of the shooting, they were in the middle of a dispute with him over unpaid rent. Number 25. Patty Peoples and Dawn Tiura. Two women and their pit bulls caused $38,000 in damages to a vacant rental property in Jacksonville, Florida, where they'd been squatting for more than a month in April of 2023. Business partners Patty Peoples and Dawn Tiura brought a repairman to the Hogan's Creek home they co-owned in order to have it checked out for a prospective buyer. The two women planned to use the resulting profits to help fund their retirement. However, upon looking around the house, the handyman discovered the illegal tenants and their pets and told the owners about them. He reportedly saw at least 10 puppies with their mother on the sunroom porch. 61-year-old Peoples went over to ask the squatters to vacate the property, but they showed her a receipt for a $3,330 rent payment, claiming they had every right to stay there. The squatters, who were in a relationship, claimed that they were victims of an online rental scam on the Zillow app. The resulting police report stated that one of the illegal tenants had been removed from a home nearby two months prior in a similar scenario. The officer had reason to believe that the woman was a serial squatter given her recent eviction. Suspicions were further raised when the address of the landlord on her previous lease agreement was the same as the landlord 
who'd supposedly allowed them to lease Peoples and Tiura's property. The victim spent over $5,000 in court fees before the eviction order was served on April the 11th of 2023. It was then discovered that the rental home had smashed tiles, torn drywall, and ripped doors. In a Fox News interview, People said that when she saw the aftermath of the squatter's extended stay, her heart dropped. She and Tiura were facing a complicated road ahead as there was a possibility that insurance wouldn't cover the damage if it was ruled that the property wasn't occupied by the illegal tenants. Peoples called on the governor and other politicians to take action against squatters throughout the state of Florida. Number 24. William Stanley in Pahrump, Nevada, on September the 6th of 2022, 66-year-old Frank Brink was run over by a car driven by his landlord. The man subsequently became affixed to the vehicle and was then dragged half a mile down the road. Nye County deputies responded to reports of a body on the side of the road and found Brink dead in the area of Kingsway and Camelot Circle. According to the sheriff's office, a trail of blood and clothes led officers a half mile from the scene to an address on Mary Lou Street. The owner of the property was 70-year-old William Stanley, who was Brink's landlord. Upon further investigation, law enforcement determined that the incident had begun with an argument between the two men. Stanley admitted to running Brink over with his white Lincoln in a rage. He subsequently tied the victim's leg to the back of a white Suzuki with a rope and dragged him to the area where the body was later found. Authorities executed a search warrant on the property and arrested the suspect on a charge of open murder. He was booked into the county detention center without bail. According to the probable cause declaration, Stanley's neighbor told investigators that several transients had been exploiting him for money leading up to the incident, which might have explained the dispute between him and Brink. Number 23. Disappearance of William C. Blodgett Jr. 69-year-old William C. Blodgett Jr. was last seen in Roswell, New Mexico on December the 23rd of 2008. Law enforcement talked to Blodgett's family, neighbors, and friends in an effort to ascertain his whereabouts. According to the man's girlfriend, he'd argued with a tenant of his, Tony Ray Peralta, shortly before he went missing. Police subsequently considered Peralta, at the time in his early 20s, a suspect in the investigation. Officers visited the property where Blodgett resided and found no immediate signs of foul play, according to the missing person report. Blodgett's personal belongings, including his vehicle, were still in place. Once investigators exhausted all actionable leads, the case went cold. Almost 15 years later, Peralta called 911 and admitted to murdering his former landlord. On May the 1st of 2023, he went to a store and borrowed a cell phone to tell authorities of his misdeeds, including that he'd buried the body on Blodgett's property. Peralta was detained and investigators obtained a search warrant for the home. They removed plywood floorboards from a detached room on the side of the house and discovered a boot bones and dentures. The victim's dental records were then positively matched with the recovered dentures. According to a criminal complaint, Peralta, who was tearful when speaking with detectives, indicated he didn't know why he'd killed Blodgett, whom he described as a good man who didn't deserve to die. He added that the reason he came forward over a decade later was because his heart hurt and that he felt he needed to confess. The suspect was booked at the Chavs County Jail on a charge of first degree murder. Number 22, Sandra Colalu. Chicago woman Sandra Colalu was held in police custody without bail on October the 13th of 2022 after she was accused of killing her 69-year-old landlord, Francis Walker. The victim owned a home on the north side of Chicago and rented out its extra rooms. Law enforcers had been called to the address on Washtenaw Avenue at least five times about various disturbances. On October the 10th, tenants reported hearing an altercation at around 2.30 a.m. Residents reportedly suspected 36-year-old Kolalu of being involved as she'd been entering other occupants' rooms without permission. One of the renters texted Walker to see if she was okay and didn't receive a response. After a few hours, tenants started receiving messages sent from Walker's phone, instructing them to let Kolalu watch her dog and to give her their keys if they left. Police were called to the residence at around noon and spoke with some of the tenants, including Kolalu. The officers found nothing incriminating and left. At around 5.40 p.m., 
Another renter called and reported Walker missing. Shortly before 7 p.m., police officers arrived just as the suspect was leaving. She gave officers permission to search her room before heading out, but nothing was found that could implicate her in Walker's disappearance. She subsequently rode in a tow truck to Foster Beach, where her car was parked, and left a plastic bag in the area. Her vehicle was then taken to a mechanic by the tow truck. Unbeknownst to her, the other tenants had been tailing the truck to where the plastic bag was disposed of. Authorities were called to the scene and found bloody rags inside the bag. The mechanic Kolalu had gone to refused to work on her car, but the tow truck driver hesitated to help her find another shop. That was when he was threatened with a knife by the woman. He then alerted nearby law enforcement and Kolalu's arrest followed. After a search warrant was executed by police, Walker's head and limbs were discovered in a freezer at her house. Kolalu allegedly dismembered the body with butcher knives. She was charged with concealment of a homicide and first-degree murder. Before the killing, the suspect had been served an eviction notice by Walker. According to the Chicago police chief, the revocation of the killer's tenancy was probably the cause of what was described as a horrific act. Number 21. Shia Fang Kerr Massachusetts man Leonard Garber was reported missing by his family on September the 26th of 2022. Local police couldn't find the 65-year-old after conducting a wellness check at his home on Mount Vernon Terrace in Newton. The next day, officers made two additional visits to the residence. At around 3 p.m. during the second visit, they discovered Garber's body wrapped in a curtain and hidden under construction materials, as well as other heavy items. The body appeared to have been purposefully concealed and had reportedly been there for more than a day. Surveillance footage from the home revealed that a woman had gone into the property days before Garber's body was found. She was later identified as 43-year-old Xu Fang Ke, who was a former tenant of the deceased at another property several years back. Authorities learned through financial records that while the two had been spending time together, the woman had stolen more than $40,000 from the victim's accounts by forging checks. After the man had become aware of the theft, a confrontation ensued and she killed him. Kerr was called to police headquarters where she reportedly confessed that she'd been stealing from her late landlord and that she'd used a hammer during the deadly attack. She was arrested, held without bail and charged with murder. Prosecutors believed that the woman had stolen the money to cover her gambling debts. Number 20. Michael Turner Jr. In the summer of 2022, an argument between a tenant and a landlord in Golden Valley, Arizona, regarding an overdue rent payment escalated out of proportion. The landlord, 42-year-old Joshua Blake, was reported missing by his family on the last day of August that year. Subsequently, Blake's tenant, 31-year-old Michael Turner Jr., attempted to take ownership of the home, located in the 6200 block of Kingman Trail, by having a bill of sale notarized. On September the 1st, he was arrested during a traffic stop. He was caught in possession of the missing man's vehicle and also had a firearm and illegal narcotics with him. Turner was booked at the Mojave County Adult Detention Facility. Eight weeks later, a body was found buried in a three-foot grave on an abandoned property and was confirmed to be Blake a day later. Turner was charged with murder to which he pleaded guilty, along with vehicle theft. On February the 3rd of 2023, he was sentenced to 23 years behind bars. Investigators believed that another suspect, 26-year-old Hunter McGuire, had aided Turner with Blake's killing and the subsequent cover-up. However, McGuire passed away before he was brought to justice. Number 19. Angel Davis During eviction proceedings in the Fairmont neighborhood of Philadelphia, on the morning of March the 29th of 2023, a landlord-tenant officer shot 35-year-old Angel Davis. The officer reportedly belonged to a private company tasked with carrying out court orders to remove tenants from rented properties from which they'd been evicted. According to investigators, Davis and her husband were trying to close the door of their home in Girard Court Apartments while the officer was simultaneously pushing it open. The woman was subsequently shot and transported to a nearby hospital in critical condition. Davis was alleged to have been armed with a knife and threatened the landlord-tenant officer during the struggle at the door. However, that accusation was contested by the woman's husband. The weapon was subsequently recovered and the tenant officer was detained. According to the latest updates, the incident was still being investigated by police. Number 18. Craig Burns Pennsylvania State Police responded to a reported shooting along Burns Drive in Tyrone Township at around 5.30 p.m. on March the 26th of 2023. 
A man told troopers that he'd been shot at two times by his 62-year-old landlord, Craig Burns. According to the victim, he looked out the front door of his home after hearing a gunshot. He then went to a neighbor to call 911. The man claimed that the shots sounded like they came from a 22 caliber gun and added that Burns owned such a weapon. After troopers searched Burns' residence, they recovered a black rifle and ammo. The landlord was arrested, whereupon he told officers that he hadn't shot his rifle during the incident, but had fired it several days earlier. Law enforcement then learned that the man in their custody was a convicted felon. When Burns was questioned further, he said that he had issues with his neighbors stealing from him and admitted to owning two 22 caliber rifles, but denied firing at his neighbors. The next day, he was arraigned and placed in Blair County Prison on a $100,000 bond. He was charged with three misdemeanor counts of recklessly endangering another person, one felony count of possession of a firearm prohibited, and one felony count of discharging a firearm into an occupied structure. Number 8. Joanne Makeda In early 2020, Florida woman Joanne Makeda, age 59, was arrested and charged with battery on a person 65 or older, following an incident that took place at her rented mobile home in Austin. Makeda's 65-year-old landlady, whose name wasn't released, had arrived at the property one evening to check on some broken items. She made her way inside the trailer after repeatedly knocking on the front door and receiving no reply. It was then that Makeda threw a bucket of human excrement into the homeowner's face. Police were called to the address and arrived to find the woman completely covered in feces. As shown by body cam footage, Makeda herself had been left covered in human waste after she and the landlady had gotten into a physical altercation. The renter took responsibility for the incident, but claimed it had been an accident. In a written statement, Makeda said she'd intended to throw a pail of water at her landlady, but reached for the wrong bucket. She was released on her own recognizance after being charged. Number 7. Manuel Velasquez In January of 2019, a real estate broker was gunned down in Salt Lake City, Utah, while he was trying to evict tenants from a property he owned in Sugar House. The 40-year-old's body was later found wrapped in a sheet and blanket in a crawl space of the apartment after he'd been reported missing by his wife. Charged in connection to his killing with tenants, Manuel Velasquez, Jessica Reese, and their friend, Diana Hernandez. The authorities had started looking for Velasquez and Reese when they couldn't find them at the address. A Salt Lake City SWAT team located them and Hernandez at another apartment, where they took them into custody after a brief standoff. Velasquez was booked on suspicion of murder, obstruction of justice, possession of a firearm by a restricted person, and a felony-level discharge of a firearm offense. His female accomplices, who were said to have attempted to clean up the crime scene at the apartment, were booked on allegations of obstruction of justice. They'd reportedly used a skateboard to move Stokoe's body into the crawl space after he'd been shot four times by 31-year-old Velasquez. The trio maintained that the real estate broker had initiated the altercation by kicking down the door and then putting Velasquez in a headlock, allegedly prompting the man to shoot him in self-defense. The victim's family disagreed with the suspect's version of events, claiming that Stoko wasn't a violent person and that he'd merely informed them they needed to clear out the property. Additionally, Velasquez had a criminal history. He was charged with attempted murder in 2010, but the case was dismissed before it could go to trial because the state's witnesses had disappeared. Number 6. Jonathan Lindale Kirk Rapper Jonathan Lindale Kirk, professionally known as The Baby, was sued in 2021 by Los Angeles homeowner Gary Pagar for close to $118,000. 29-year-old Kirk and a small group of his associates had rented out Pagar's house for a private vacation. However, as stated by Pagar in the lawsuit, they violated the rental agreement terms by having approximately 40 people at the home, including YouTuber Jake Paul. Kirk was accused to have used the property to allow a full commercial film crew to record a music video. Moreover, when 64-year-old Pagar confronted him, he was beat, punched, spat on, threatened, shoved, and robbed by the rapper and members of his entourage. A clip of the altercation would show Pagar being pushed to the ground in his driveway and punched by one of Kirk's associates as the rapper and Paul watched on from a nearby car. In the suit, Pagar also stated that Kirk then followed him inside the house, took his phone, 
and threatened to stop him from calling the police. The rapper and his team fled the premises once the authorities were eventually alerted. Pictures from the home showed dozens of firearms on the premises, including a multitude of AK-47 assault rifles. As per Pagar's claims, the incident had left the house with a broken foyer sculpture, stolen kitchenware, a massive amount of trash, and damages to the upholstery and floor. Number 5. Randall J. Hennessy On September the 14th of 2021, a man from Biddeford, Maine, was gunned down while trying to evict a tenant. 31-year-old Douglas Michaud and his girlfriend, Jamie Wakefield, lived in a three-story apartment building owned by the former and the room below them had been rented out to Randall J. Hennessy, aged 30. He and Michaud had had trouble in the past and the landlord was in the process of kicking Hennessy out. Wakefield would later report to the authorities that she'd been having a confrontational talk with Hennessy outside the building. When Michaud approached them and told the tenant to leave her alone, he walked back inside while the couple went to the front porch. Hennessy then emerged armed with a handgun and shot Michaud multiple times in the chest before going back inside. As Wakefield was tending to him, Hennessy returned and shot his landlord once more in the head at point-blank range. He fled the scene on a dirt bike and rode along train tracks from Biddeford to New Hampshire. The authorities talked with him over the phone and he agreed to surrender at a location in Durham. Hennessy's case is ongoing and in December of 2021, he pleaded not guilty to murder and gun charges. Number 4. Ellen Wink A Connecticut public official was charged with murder in January of 2022 after she had shot a tenant dead inside the Norwalk residence that she owned. At the time, Ellen Wink, age 61, was the city's deputy Republican registrar of voters and she'd served as city clerk from 2009 to 2011. She and her tenant, 54-year-old Kirk Lametta, had been in a long-running dispute over rent payment. Wink had previously been arrested for illegally locking Lametta out of the house, and she was also reported to have disposed of his belongings in the city dump. On January the 20th, Wink went to the home and fatally shot Lametta five times with a revolver. She then left the premises and called 911, telling dispatch that the man had come at her because she'd been cleaning up the abode. Court documents indicated, however, that Wink then admitted to responding officers that she'd shot Lametta, adding, He's been my tenant and driving me nuts. The woman's bail was initially set at $1 million, but later upgraded to $2.5 million in February of 2022, following the emergence of cell phone footage, which seemingly disproved the public official's claims of self-defense. Lametta had recorded his encounter with Wink on his cell phone. The two had had a conversation and at no point did the tenant appear to make a move towards the woman. Three minutes into the clip, she turned around and began shooting at Lametta, seemingly following him as he attempted to flee. She then picked up the phone and threw it outside, which prosecutors argued was her preventing him from immediately calling for help. Number 3. Donald Wayne Toomer Jr. 45-year-old Kyla Oliver was found in critical condition at her home in Grand Bay, Alabama after she'd been viciously attacked by a former tenant in April of 2016. The woman had to be placed in a medically induced coma for treatment at the University of South Alabama Trauma Center after suffering multiple lacerations to her face. Donald Wayne Toomer Jr. was identified as a suspect and arrested at his residence roughly an hour after the attack. Toomer had rented a room from Oliver roughly four years prior and admitted to have punched the victim seven or eight times but the police suspected that an axe retrieved from the scene had also been used in the attack. Tuma didn't state a clear reason for the attack, but did mention being aggravated by unspecified rumors Oliver had allegedly spread about him. He was initially charged with burglary and assault, but at the recommendation of the Mobile County District Attorney, the charges were later upgraded to attempted murder. Number 2. Rampasol Pasord Rampasord Pasord was charged with murder and arson in September of 2019 after he'd started the fire that killed his former landlady. 49-year-old Pasord was reportedly angry that the woman, identified as 63-year-old Bibi Jasmine by the New York Post, had kicked him out of their shared Queens Village home. Jasmine was reportedly helping the man 
who'd arrived in New York City a few months prior from Guyana. He'd initially claimed that he didn't have a place to stay while visiting the city, but the visit turned into an indefinite stay. Persaud reportedly didn't pay rent or bills and eventually started threatening Jasmine with violence before she eventually kicked him out in late August. He sought vengeance and, as the woman slept, Persaud doused her bedroom in flammable liquid and then set it ablaze. At the time, Jasmine was wheelchair-bound after having recently suffered a stroke. She was unable to escape the first-floor home on her own and was later found dead in her bed. Persaud admitted to setting the fatal fire upon being arrested by the NYPD, and surveillance footage had captured him pacing outside the building on 219th Street near Hillside Avenue prior to the incident. Number 1. Dmitry Mikhailov In 2011, Virginia woman Lisa Sales agreed to rent out her basement for $2,000 per month to Russian immigrant Dmitry Mikhailov, who was attending graduate school at George Washington University School of Business. They got along at first, with reports claiming that Sales was treating Mikhailov like a younger brother. The woman nevertheless found her tenant suspicious. His life was far from that of a regular student, as he drove a luxury Mercedes and would always buy multiple rounds of alcohol for people when they went out. Their relationship was irreparably fractured on September the 16th, when Mikhailov returned home after a night of heavy drinking and attacked sales. He slammed her dog against a dresser before throwing the woman to the ground and attempting to abuse her. The assault allegedly lasted for several hours with the intoxicated Mikhailov continuously pushing down his landlady and groping her. He attempted to strangle her in the bathroom, but she broke free and managed to barricade herself with furniture in her bedroom. The attack left sales with injuries to her cervical spine and Mikhailov was subsequently charged with battery, to which he eventually pleaded guilty. He spent less than a month in jail and days after his arrest, sales went through his belongings. She found a flash drive that contained an investment report listing total assets of over $16 million and a letter to Mikhailov written by his father, Valery, from Lefatovo, a Russian prison, where the country's most high-profile criminals are detained. As she pieced her tenant's life together, Sales found that his father had at one point been one of the CIA's most valuable assets. He'd reportedly agreed to spy for the agency in 2001 and spent six years collecting information on the Kremlin and President Vladimir Putin before he was eventually arrested by Russian authorities. The woman contacted the FBI and expressed her suspicion that Mikhailov had fiduciary responsibility for his imprisoned father, but didn't receive an answer back. Eventually, in a civil suit against Mikhailov, Sales was awarded $300,000 in damages for assault and battery and for infliction of emotional distress. Number 9. Chad Reed 53-year-old Michigan landlord Chad Reed was accused of murdering his two tenants in October of 2020. Joseph Soule and his girlfriend Jacqueline Leepard, both in their early 30s, had rented an upstairs room at Reed's Battle Creek home. It was reported that Reed and his tenants didn't get along. They fought about money and the landlord had also repeatedly confronted the couple about their partying, which kept him up at night. After killing Soule and Lippert, Reed stashed their bodies in the back of his truck for about a week. Once the couple was reported missing, the police came to his home but found no evidence of foul play. Reed would eventually surrender to the authorities and confess to the double homicide. This occurred at roughly the same time as the police had received a tip from a source who knew Reed claiming that the tenants had been killed. The landlord stated that he'd shot Soule after he pulled a knife on him during an argument. He opened fire on Lippert as she attempted to run away from the house. Reed then strangled, stabbed, and beat her to death with a metal pipe. A few days after his arrest, a fire broke out at the home, destroying most of the victim's possessions. It's unclear what connection, if any, the landlord had had with the blaze. Number 8. Lorenzo Simon In April of 2014, landlord Lorenzo Simon stabbed his tenant in the neck when he complained of the handiwork he was forced to do around his apartment in Birmingham, England. 34-year-old Simon had reportedly accepted Michael Spaulding as a tenant in exchange for his handyman skills. By multiple accounts, Spaulding was treated horrendously by Simon in what the authorities described as slave labor. He was given only one meal per day and forced to work on the apartment from the early hours of the morning until past midnight. 
The handyman wasn't allowed to go out unless his landlord gave him permission. Spaulding eventually complained about the inhumane treatment and an argument erupted with Simon. Neighbors heard him saying he was tired and hungry, to which the landlord responded aggressively. Investigators later determined that he'd also accused Spaulding of damaging his Volkswagen Passat in a crash. As the fight escalated, Simon fatally stabbed his tenant. He used a hacksaw to dismember his body, which he placed into two suitcases and then dumped in the Birmingham Canal. In May of 2014, the suitcases were recovered from the water, one containing Spaulding's torso and the other his head, limbs, and the tools used in the dismemberment. The police traced the killing back to Simon, who denied any wrongdoing. However, testimonies from neighbors with reports of a bonfire in the garden and the subsequent discovery of a humorous bone fragment inside a charred drum were enough to secure an arrest. Simon would later confess to his crime and was jailed for 19 years. Number 7. Jerry David Thompson In July of 2020, a tenant decapitated his landlord with a samurai sword following a rent dispute. 64-year-old Victor King, a professional bridge player, was attacked at his Connecticut home by tenant Jerry David Thompson a day earlier. King had reported 42-year-old Thompson to the police for waving the sword at him over a rent dispute. The authorities were alerted once more when King's friends hadn't heard from him. Officers went to the house in Hartford and found his lifeless body on the kitchen floor. He'd been slashed, beheaded, and then partially covered with a sheet. A manhunt ensued and the police arrested Thompson. He told the authorities that all they needed was a piece of paper from the glove compartment of his Jeep. According to the paperwork, Thompson, who had prior convictions for assault and robbery, saw himself as a sovereign citizen and hence not subject to the law. The suspected murderer refused to provide any details about the atrocious killing and was held on a $2 million bail. Number 6. Patrick Maher In February of 2021, a main tenant fatally stabbed his landlord in what was regarded by the authorities as an unprovoked attack. 24-year-old Patrick Maher had been rented a room from Troy and Dulcie Varney. In the days leading up to the double homicide, a relative of the couple claimed that Dulcie had become afraid of the tenant. One of Maher's family members reported that in recent weeks, he'd been struggling with depression over lockdown restrictions. He ambushed his landlords with a knife and started stabbing them repeatedly. The police responded to a home invasion call at the couple's Turner property at around 1.30 a.m. Even though he'd been severely wounded, it was reported that Troy had put up a fight and managed to hold on to Maher until the officers arrived at the scene. Both Troy and Dulcie were later pronounced dead at a hospital in Lewiston. The tenant was arrested and charged with two counts of murder. Number 5. Daniel Walsh In 2020, a tenant from Derbyshire, England was found guilty of murdering his landlord and then feeding parts of his body to badgers. In June of that year, 71-year-old Graham Snell had gone to a police station to complain that his tenant, 30-year-old Daniel Walsh, had been stealing money from his bank account. The following morning, an officer arrived at the man's property, but there was no answer, and the calls to his cell phone went straight to voicemail. Walsh subsequently visited a DIY store where he purchased 10 garbage bags and two saws, which he used to dispose of the body. In the following days, Walsh made several trips to casinos, arcades, and massage parlors with the money he was able to obtain from the elderly man's account after his death. When the police examined the area in early July, they found pieces of Snell's body buried in the woods nearby. Many of the remains had been pushed down a badger den, and the animals had reportedly nibbled on them. Following Walsh's arrest, it took a jury just over an hour to unanimously find him guilty of murdering the elderly landlord. Number 4. Michael Dudley in June of 2020, Seattle landlord Michael Dudley was charged with two counts of murder in the second degree for the killing of his tenants Jessica Lewis and Austin Wenner. It's believed that 35-year-old Lewis and Wenner, aged 27, were murdered following a dispute over rent. Neighbors called 911 and reported hearing gunfire. According to one witness, a man had yelled out, please don't do this, just let me leave, before the shots were heard. There was no response at the residence when the police arrived. When they obtained a search warrant, officers found bullet holes and blood inside one of the rooms. Dudley dismembered the bodies and disposed of the remains in bags throughout various bodies of water. Several days 
after the police had been called to the property, a suitcase was found on a West Seattle beach by TikTok users. They'd opened it, believing it held valuables, but were immediately overcome by the smell. They called the police and posted the footage of the bodies being found, which subsequently became viral. Based on the analysis of a forensic anthropologist, Dudley may have had accomplices. The cuts on the victims' bodies were disorganized and executed in different manners with various devices. Number 3. Scott Edmund Pettigrew On June the 14th of 2016, Mimi Anita Cohen was found floating face down in the swimming pool of her home in Palm Springs, California. A few days earlier, the 65-year-old woman had gone to the police to ask for a restraining order against her tenant, Scott Edmund Pettigrew. She'd agreed to let him a room back in February, and his behavior gradually became more erratic in the months that followed. He'd poured water over the woman's computer, stolen her food, and allowed his dogs to defecate in the house. He'd only paid one month's rent and would threaten the landlady whenever she'd question him about the money. Cohen told the police that she lived in constant fear of what Pettigrew would do next, in spite of the woman's complaints. The court didn't evict Pettigrew and gave him a five-yard restraining order. Less than a week later, he killed Cohen. When the police arrived to find Cohen unresponsive in the pool, they also found 50-year-old Pettigrew inside the house, lying naked on his bed. His body was covered in scratches. The police found a digital audio recorder under the kitchen table. In the audio file, which was about one minute long, a woman was heard shouting over the sounds of an altercation. Investigators believed that the voice was Cohen's, screaming at her attacker to go away and leave her alone. Pettigrew was charged with murder along with elder abuse and the violation of a protective order. Number 2. Alec Garcis In January of 2020, a landlord from Queens, New York was killed by his tenant as he tried to collect $200 in unpaid rent. While talking on the phone with his wife, 71-year-old Edgar Moncayo arrived at the property he owned in the Corona neighborhood. His tenant, 22-year-old Alex Garces, answered the front door and an altercation ensued as Moncayo tried to enter the property. The fight was captured by a doorbell camera. Garces pushed the elderly man down the flight of stairs leading up to the front door. Moncayo landed on his back and sustained a devastating injury as his head snapped into the concrete. He was taken to Elmhurst Hospital and put on life support but was eventually pronounced dead. In the incident's aftermath, Garces was charged with manslaughter. If you feel like watching some more They Will Kill You content, even after this extra long video, then we have our video When Airbnb Goes Wrong, lined up for you right after this. Number 1. Lee Family In 2017, a horrific quadruple homicide occurred in Qingdao, one of China's most modern cities. 40-year-old Li Jitsong, his wife and his parents lived in a rented apartment on the fifth floor of a residential building. The apartment's owner, the Ji family, lived upstairs on the sixth floor. After the landlord had come to the apartment to ask for the overdue rent, Lee planned to kidnap and rob the Ji family. He convinced his wife and parents to join him. They first lured the landlord and head of the Ji family under the pretense that the TV was broken. Afterwards, they tricked his wife by pretending they were going to sign a new contract. Next, they lured the couple's adult children. All members of the G family were bound and suffocated. The Lee family then robbed their flat before fleeing to Beijing on November the 15th. All were apprehended the following day. They pled guilty and were sentenced to death. Number 8. Ramis Januzzi Three Australian Airbnb hosts were charged with the murder of a 36-year-old man who was staying at their home in the Melbourne suburb of East Brighton. In October of 2017, Ramis Junuzzi rented a room at the Airbnb listed residence belonging to Jason Colton, Ryan Smart and Craig Levy. Junuzzi ultimately decided to remain in the $30 a night room for a full week in spite of the fact that his bank account lacked the sufficient funds to pay for the extended stay. As Junuzzi's checkout date drew nearer, the three homeowners became increasingly suspicious that he was going to leave without paying the agreed upon fee. The three men reportedly confronted Junuzzi in relation to their concerns on a number of occasions throughout the week before on October the 25th, discovering that there was a mere $6 in the occupant's account. 
A physical altercation subsequently broke out between Junozzi and Colton, with the latter allegedly placing the former in a chokehold before carrying him outside the house with the help of Smart and Levy. Colton would later tell police he was solely attempting to subdue the victim, but Junozzi passed away on the front lawn as a direct result of the physical stress that had been placed on his body during the struggle. The forensic pathologist that conducted Junozzi's autopsy ultimately discovered that the man had modest levels of methamphetamine, codeine and other substances in his system at the time of his death. All three of the homeowners were jailed in connection to the deadly incident. It was Colton's second stint behind bars as he'd already served three months in prison for assaulting a housemate in 2013. Number 7. Christina Cooks and Juliana Panunzio Two young women were fatally shot during a house party at an Airbnb in Ontario on January the 19th of 2021. The victims were identified as 18-year-old Christina Cooks and Juliana Panunzio, aged 20. The Toronto area residents were attending a birthday gathering at a waterfront chalet in Fort Erie when the deadly shooting occurred. The Airbnb in question was regularly rented out by various out-of-town groups, many of whom were the subject of noise complaints from neighbors. It wasn't, however, loud music that prompted local residents to call 911 on the night of the incident, but rather the sound of gunfire. Police officers were dispatched to the building at about 4.15 a.m. Upon their arrival, they found the bodies of Crooks and Panunzio, both of which showed extensive signs of trauma, and the victims were pronounced dead at the scene. All of the partygoers fled after the shooting had taken place, and none of them remained at the residence when law enforcement arrived to investigate. Homicide detectives primarily relied on tips from the public in their efforts to identify persons of interest in the case. 22-year-old Christopher Lucas, a Scarborough rapper known also as El Plaga, was eventually charged with the two murders, while Heidi Baylor and Trevor Barnett, both aged 29, faced accessory to murder charges. The suspects' motives for the fatal shooting were not made public by the police during their initial investigation. Number 6. The Gainesville Stabbing a 52-year-old man was accused of stabbing one of his co-workers while they were sharing an Airbnb on a business trip to Gainesville, Florida in November of 2021. Michael Denmark had rented the property along with four of his colleagues. Denmark became embroiled in a contentious argument, the specifics of which allegedly centered on food with the victim. The conflict took place in the kitchen of the rented unit and reportedly escalated to violence when Denmark brandished the knife and stabbed his co-worker three times in the leg and once in the chest. The victim, left in critical condition, was rushed to a nearby hospital where he underwent emergency surgery that fortunately saved his life. Denmark was taken into custody on one count of aggravated battery, but prosecutors subsequently upgraded their charges against him to attempted second-degree murder. Denmark was held on a $200,000 bond in the Aluccia County Jail while he awaited his case's court proceedings. Number 5. La Chol In July of 2018, a 19-year-old woman was murdered at the EQ Tower apartment she'd rented with her friends for the weekend through Airbnb. La Chol of Melbourne was fatally stabbed by a teenager who was left unidentified due to his status as a minor. Chol's violent demise was precipitated by a physical struggle between the two, which was captured by the rental property surveillance cameras. Although the murder was initially reported to have been spontaneous rather than premeditated, it was discovered by investigators that there had been pre-existing animosity between Chol and the teenager responsible for her death. The boy had reportedly gate-crashed the party, being thrown by Chol and her companions, and after the victim discovered her cell phone had gone missing, she told him to leave, which triggered the altercation that led to the stabbing. Although the teenager was initially given the maximum sentence of 20 years in prison, his defense team contended that the crime didn't meet the legal threshold for murder and sought to have his conviction dismissed accordingly. Number 4. Tyrone Noseworthy A teenage rap artist from Canada was among the three individuals fatally shot at a downtown Toronto Airbnb. On January the 31st of 2020, 
19-year-old Tyrone Noseworthy, who also went by the name 4000 and was one half of the rap duo called Talop Twins, was attended a social gathering at the rental apartment on the night of the incident. The gunfire reportedly originated inside the condo unit, but the casualties subsequently spilled out into the hallway, according to testimony given by neighbors. Law enforcement officers were called to the building at about 10.30 p.m., by which point two of the victims had already succumbed to gunshot wounds. A third man later passed away as he was tended to at the hospital while a fourth was seriously injured but ultimately survived. Authorities identified those who died as noseworthy, 20-year-old Joshua Gibson Skier and Jalen Coley, aged 21. Toronto police would later reveal that the preliminary evidence gathered by investigators suggested one of the deceased had killed the others, although they didn't specify who of them might have been responsible. Noseworthy had appeared in a number of music videos alongside another local rapper named Keyshawn Brown, better known by the stage name Wise. Brown had been shot dead inside his home in Surrey a little over a month prior to Noseworthy's demise. Number 3. Yuiko Takaoka In February of 2020, San Jose police took 25-year-old Ryoichi Fusia into custody as part of a murder investigation involving the man's deceased girlfriend. Fusia and his partner, Yuiko Takaoka, aged 26, were staying at an Airbnb cottage in East Foothills in the days leading up to the deadly event. Fusia had allegedly attacked his girlfriend with a knife and fatally stabbed her before absconding with the woman's car and all of his belongings on February the 18th. Authorities were called to the scene at around 4 p.m. after they'd received reports of a dead body inside the rental home. Takaoka's mutilated corpse was found beneath blood-soaked sheets with a bloody kitchen knife positioned nearby. Fusia turned himself into the police just a day after the crime had been committed. The deceased woman's vehicle was found at the home belonging to Fusia's mother in San Lorenzo, where it had been taken by the man himself the previous day. Fusia, who only spoke Japanese, waived his right to an interpreter during his arraignment on charges of murder with a weapon enhancement. The property was temporarily taken out of Airbnb's listings following the stabbing, while the homeowner declined to comment on the incident after being approached by reporters. Number 2. Carla Stefaniak In November of 2018, while she was vacationing in Costa Rica, a Miami woman was stabbed to death at an Airbnb where she and her sister-in-law were staying. Carla Stefaniak had taken the holiday to Central America in order to celebrate her 36th birthday. Her partially decomposed body was found roughly 300 yards from the rental villa. She had suffered multiple stab wounds to the neck and upper extremities and had also sustained an unspecified form of blunt force trauma to the head. Police in Costa Rica identified 32-year-old Bismarck Espinosa Martinez, aged 32, as the perpetrator of Stefaniak's murder. Martinez worked as a security guard at the Via Buena Vista Resort, where the victim was staying during her trip. Stefaniak had been communicating with family members in the days leading up to her death. Her last message indicated that she was going to ask a guard to get her some water, though it's unclear whether Stefaniak was referring to Martinez. The latter was sentenced to 16 years in a Costa Rican prison by a panel of three judges. Number 1. Lauren Casaira A high school teacher from New York City was brutally murdered in an Airbnb villa on the Yucatan Peninsula in July of 2018. Lauren Casaira, aged 35, had taken a vacation to Mexico by herself and the trip was immediately fraught with tension and unease. Following her arrival, Kasaira texted a close friend and told them she was creeped out by the rental property's manager. According to Kasaira's messages, which would later constitute important evidence in the murder investigation, the manager repeatedly flirted with the young woman and was later caught watching her from a window while she sunbathed by the pool. On one occasion, the man offered Kasaira a drink, which the teacher declined before locking herself in her room for the night. The next morning, the housekeeper found the young woman lying unclothed and unconscious on the floor of her room. Rather than contact the authorities, however, the property manager proceeded to wash and dress Kasaira with the housekeeper's help, while a local doctor was called in to examine her. The victim ultimately passed away from injuries she'd sustained during the apparent attack 
in her room, but investigators struggled to identify any suspects in the case. The manager was neither arrested nor charged in connection to the incident and, according to employees at the villa, he moved to Switzerland after the property had become engulfed in controversy stemming from the murder. The Casaira family has publicly endorsed the notion that Mexican authorities had botched the investigation and they've also levied criticism against Airbnb for their tepid efforts to provide aid to the victim's grieving loved ones. Thanks for watching. Would you rather buy a home in the country or rent one in the city? Let us know in the comments section below.